Uh, thanks for joining me. So some of you, I think, are going to probably be new. So for those of the, you that, that are new, my name is Dr. Peter Noel. I'm a uh, board-certified veterinary radiologist. Um, I did my vet school at Purdue University. That I did an internship at uh, University of Pennsylvania, and then I did a residency at the Animal Medical Center in New York City. And uh, I don't know, about 10 weeks ago, I just decided to give back to the community uh, and, and uh, my fellow veterinarians. And this was kind of the, the idea that I had. And so, um, and uh, so far, so good. This is the 10th time we've done it. We're meeting just about, we've met almost every Monday, 6 p.m. We're going to keep doing it. Uh, I'm at least going to do it for a year and commit to it. And we've been getting some good feedback. So uh, for those of you that are new, um, looks like Dr. Allen, Dr. Allen's a long time, long time listener, first time caller. Dr. Allen is uh, in, in Australia and she's boarding a plane. So uh, always, always happy to have her. Um, so let's see here couple of housekeeping things for, for those of you that are new or uh, for, for those of you that are returning. Make sure to crank up the brightness on your monitor. Really, really bright. That'll help you. Uh, dim the room if you have the ability to dim the room unless you're on the airplane. Um, I think you'll get the most out of this is if you commit to a differential, you commit to a diagnosis, you commit to an abnormality. So you just kind of go for it and... Uh, and, and really try to um, ideally write it down in the comments if you want. Uh, these are all going to be pushed to YouTube after the fact if you want me to sort of edit out some of your comments or, or anything. If you're worried about looking silly, we can we can certainly do that. So, uh, But I, I think if you commit to, to a diagnosis or, or an abnormality, it'll really make you uh, press yourself in order to try to, to try to see if there's anything wrong. So what we're going to do um is we are going to present some cases and I will give a there'll be a pause after I present sort of the history uh segment history and then the images and that's your cue to sort of look over the images uh, I obviously have to control them but you should then look and decide uh, what you think is abnormal depending on on how tricky the the study is um, you may get a minute, minute and a half. And, and, sh and this is for you. So if you want longer, let me know. If it's going too slow, let me know. I, I think we may have a, a wide, uh, there, there may be a lot of variability in people's experiences. So some of these may be easy. Some of these may be hard. Um, so it can be kind of hard to control for that. But minute, minute and a half pause. And then I'll start telling you what, uh, what I think is wrong. And then we'll have a little bit of time for you to ask questions about the cases. So um, without further ado, if anybody has any questions, concerns, comments, I'm going to give you the first question, the first, uh, the first study. I'm going to go for this one, the first one right out of the gate. Somebody reached out on Facebook and had a question about differentiating a couple of different diseases, two different diseases in particular. So I'll, I'll present this case. This is a known outcome. So I know uh, some of these cases I'll present are hot off of our teleradiology list. And so we don't know the outcome. So that's usually an exciting thing for you and, and me, since I don't know. Uh, but a couple of cases that we'll start with are going to be uh, known outcomes. Okay, right, so there's an eight-year-old, um, maybe a seven-year-old uh, female spade Doberman pincher that has presented for coughing. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, five radiographs, okay? So I'm gonna start the timer and then we can figure out what you guys think. Uh, okay, then about minute 45, anybody got anything? Anything, say the dumbest stuff that you want. We'll go ahead and erase it so it doesn't go to YouTube. This is, uh, this is for you guys, so let's, let's hear it. So Doc Allen is talking about a diffuse unstructured interstitial pattern, Dr. Kirkland. Or, uh, Dr. Kirkland is talking about a perihilar unstructured interstitial pattern, something going on at the heart base. One of the things that we do, I'm going to put a little timer here, make sure we don't spend, one, part of the goal of this is to see as many cases as we can and not spend all day, but it's also important to, um, to, to kind of make sure you guys understand. So coughing Doberman has a heart condition until proven otherwise. Heart shape is funny. Diaphragm looks pulled inwards. 
I would say pericardial effusion. Okay. So this doc is on it um, in terms of the cardiac stuff. So right away, one of the things with the signament is you should realize that Dobermans like to get dilated cardiomyopathy and Dobermans with dilated cardiomyopathy like to undergo heart failure in a bit of a uh, odd presentation. Sometimes people will describe it as a, almost looks like a bronchial pattern or a bronchial interstitial pattern. And a lot of times these Dobermans come in with coughing and they will uh, take radiographs and they go, wow, there's a bronchial pattern, bronchial interstitial pattern. I wonder if the dog's got bronchitis or some sort of pneumonia. And in fact, it's just their way of manifesting cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So uh, the technique is a right lateral view, the diaphragm, the crow are parallel. He's rotated, right? You see these ribs are offset and the limbs are offset. And we wouldn't be surprised that he's rotated because he's deep chested. And that narrow deep chest can be hard to position and he's probably trying to die so the combination of that um but one of the things that that i think is abnormal is there's way too much opacity here so you got to make sure you're not faked out by the rib this whole area right in here there's too much opacity there's too much opacity here there's too much opacity kind of right here and then you see this structure that kind of jets out back this way it's sort of tubular and soft tissue slash fluid opaque and that tubular structure is sort of emanating from the area of the left atrium which is more than likely a dilated pulmonary vein you've got this this is a big blood vessel as well with maybe some peribronchial cuffing um but you don't get a ton of help and the reason i wanted to sh show you this case is because i i think it's kind of a hard case so for those of you that maybe are just joining that this is not a straightforward case i do think there's an increased opacity here right so you've got the trachea the trachea comes down here and it stops here and if you hallucinate with me you got the cranial right cranial lobar bronchus and you'll see it in the right caudal lobar bronchus the accessory goes this way the left caudal goes that way and so sitting right in here is the left atrium and when the x-ray beam flies through the patient this way and, and it hits more tissue here, less, uh, less photon, less of the x-ray beam actually hits the detector and so it looks more opaque. And so this cardiac silhouette is a little bit enlarged, mild left-sided cardiomegaly. But when you have mild left-sided cardiomegaly and then what I would describe as a bronchointerstitial pattern that's diffuse, but I do think it's worse, caudal and dorsal. Um, so you see here, it just looks like there's a little bit more funk than, than in the craniventral lung lobe. And a lot of times we talked historically about dogs when you when you try to decide is the lung pattern worse, cranial and ventral, which is sort of your pneumonia cases or caudal and dorsal, which is your non-cardiogenic versus cardiogenic pulmonary edema cases. Dobermans don't always follow that. Um, but in this particular case, I still think even though the lung pattern is not your classic alveolar pattern, caudally and dorsally, like you'd expect a left-sided congestive heart failure, I do think that it's worse caudally and dorsally and in the perihyla region. But just so that we make sure we're talking about this, I think is cardiac tissue. There's there's probably edema on either side of it. And so that's why the margin gets blurred, right? Because when the gas comes into the patient, air, radiolucent comes into the lung. We want that blackness to contrast with the whiteness or the opaque cardiac tissue, the opaque pulmonary edema, the opaque vasculature. We're looking for opaque you can have radiolucent disease in the lung, but in this particular case, we're looking for radiopaque disease. And so we really want to have good contrast, but that becomes blurred. The margin becomes indistinct because it's surrounded not by gas, but by edema. So this is Doberman with a DCM um, and, and they have, uh, he's got low grade edema. Now you'll notice that these were taken just after midnight on April 12th. And then about 12 hours later, when he's been hit with Lasix, you'll start to see these side by side and you can kind of appreciate how your, we sometimes talk about the furosemide trial or the Lasix trial. So on the right side here, you've got the pre-furosemide, pre-Lasix. On the left side here, you've got the post. These are right and right. And you'll notice that the lungs just look busier everywhere um, compared to, to this radiograph right here. So especially caudally here, you'll notice that there's a caudal dorsal lung pattern and here it's, it's much improved. And then on the left lateral view, and then let's see the left lateral view. And you'll notice it just looks busier, bronchointerstitial, this blood vessel out here is just way too big and everything just looks a little bit nicer here. So within a relatively short period of time, you've given that loop diuretic and the loop diuretic tells the lymphatics to uh, the interstitial lymphatics to pull that low protein fluid and it pulls it and it pulls it fairly quickly to reduce those left-sided pressures. And so 
that's that's really all I wanted to, uh, to to sort of comment on. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Did that Doberman have cardiomegaly? Yeah, the Doberman did. It did, and it does. I think it's better. So on the right here, I think this whole tissue right here is is car is is cardiac silhouette. It's the left atrium that's too big. Um, this is a great example. So the case over here on the left is the case post Lasix. And the cardiac silhouette you can see is smaller than here. I could do the VHS, but I'm not, unless you really want me to. But this would be a good case where you could do the vertebral heart score and you could compare this one to that one. But I can just eyeball these and say this one is smaller. The lung pattern is better. This is a great example of where you got to be careful on this particular study because the rib comes over and the rib can fake you out that there's left-sided cardiomegaly. So I still, there is still left-sided cardiomegaly. And I know that because I've got all this data, the previous study, the Doberman. Um, but I, I think this is an example where sometimes you can be faked out with the, 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 uh, the rib. Um, this is a great example of a DV view. So just throw, just, we're just doing it. We're just throwing, throwing things out there. Okay. We're learning. So I'm just going to keep talking until we go to the next case, but that DV view is really great. We talk about DV views. You put the sternum on the table, right? And the X-ray beam, the photons come firing through the patient this way. We like DV views because it tends to aerate the caudal lung better. So when the patient is in sternal recumbency, these lung lobes get more air and we want the black air to come in because again, the black air attenuates differently than the fluid, than the blood vessels, than other pathology. And so we really like the DV views for cardiac disease. So this is a great example of a DV view where you've got one dome, there's one uh, hoof of the diaphragm over here instead of the, the three bumps that we get with VD. So we always joke that Mickey Mouse has VD or venereal disease. So Mickey Mouse, you get the three Mickey Mouse humps on the on the VD view. The opposite is you get one hump on the DV view. And these blood vessels on the DV view, they always look bigger. And the reason that they look bigger is because they're magnified. So these blood vessels, they, they cruise out here, right? And they're further away from the table. And so they're further away from the table. So they're magnified, so they look better. Okay. Capisci. Uh, okay, so I think we're good. We got we got a hard case. That's a hard case. Doberman DCM. We've talked about Doberman DCM for eight minutes and forty five seconds. If, uh, if if that's if that's uh, if you're not bored, we can keep going. But I, I think we should do another case because we, we need to we need to cruise through some cases. Okay, here we go. There's six radiographs, but I'm going to give you three. Okay, and this is a dog that. Uh, presented for tachypnea. It's like a four-year-old mixed breed dog that presented for tachypnea. So we got a left lateral view, a right lateral view, right lateral, left lateral, VD view. Okay, go to work. Let's do it. Anybody have anything normal? Is it normal? Is it not normal? Do you want me some of the new, the new folks? I'll tell you how I go through these thoracic radiographs quickly uh, after, after we get through this case, if you find that helpful. Fluid-filled lungs, poor dog is drowning, heart looks round, another heart condition, heart failure. Drowning on dry land, that's what we say. Um, cardiomegaly, enlarged left atrium, severe, uh, diffuse, unstructured interstitial pattern. Globoid cardiac silhouette. So one of the things, let's see, let's let's tackle this. So uh, cardiac silhouette is enlarged. Cardiac silhouette is enlarged, characterized by a mildly enlarged left atrium and dorsal displacement of the thoracic trachea. So this is the heart, the cardiac silhouette is too tall. Uh, the left atrium is enlarged. It doesn't look like your classic case of, it's also got a left auricular bulge. So 12, 1, 2, 2 to 3 on the VD is a uh, left oracle. And so you've also got uh, a rounding of the cardiac apex here near the left ventricle. Okay, so two to three left auricular bulge. Here's the left atrium. It's tall. So we think about left-sided ventricular enlargement, and the whole thing just kind of gets big. Um, but this dog also has DCM. And uh, the lung pattern in this particular dog, I think, is one of those cases where it's not as straightforward as you would hope because there's involvement of the cranial lung lobes. So if I were to ask you, where's the lung pattern worse? Is it caudal and dorsal or is it cranial and ventral? 
you know, on this view, you'd say, I don't know, it's, it's a bit mixed here. It does look a little bit worse caudally and dorsally when you flip the dog over onto the VD view. It does look like it's probably a little bit worse caudally and dorsally. The blood vessels are not particularly large. Here's a pulmonary vein. Here's a pulmonary artery. They're a little bit chunky out there, but look at this bad boy. That's a pulmonary artery. Left cranial lobar artery is, is a little bit too big. Okay, so for the lung patterns, I think we get all hot and bothered about is it vascular, is it bronchial, is it bronchointerstitial, is it alveolar, is it some sort of combination? I think what can be more useful is distribution, especially when you're worried about a cardiac problem. So in, in, in order to not make this complicated, you could just look at the cardiac silhouette and say, I feel like this is too big. And for those of you that want to kind of know to do the vertebral heart score, you don't need to do it in this case, but if you were worried, one, two, three, four, and T4, you drop it to, what's this, 14.2? The big old heart, 14.2, and then you go to 11.75. Okay, and so then you go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, probably a little larger than 12 in the vertebral heart score. So the cardiac's too, too large. So you've convinced yourself that the cardiac's so it's too big, and then you convince yourself that you have the murmur. And then you see that the lungs are not normal. And then you think, well, even though there's this ventral lung pattern, it's possible that the dog has pulmonary hemorrhage. It's possible that the dog has acute lung injury. It's possible that the dog has some sort of severe pneumonia, but just common things happen commonly. You've got this pretty bad lung pattern. It does involve the caudal lungs on this view. I do think that it's probably worse caudally here. So heart failure. Um, you know, don't overinterpret this and go, oh my God, there's like a mass looking thing here that you can kind of drop calipers on and, and so on. So another case of the heart failure, okay? Pretty easy. Uh, as far as the globoid cardiac silhouette, I wouldn't describe this as globoid. So the reason I wouldn't describe it as globoid, because globoid does to me, looks just like a basket. I mean, it looks perfectly round. So you will lose the shape of the cardiac silhouette. And I think you would look at this and you would say it still looks like a silhouette. And in fact, there's a there's a, a flamboyant cardiac waist here, and it still looks sort of almond-shaped on that view. Uh, it still looks kind of almond-shaped on that view, and there's this waist here. And then on this view, you know, it, it doesn't look like this. It still has that sort of tapered. So I would say that this has a shape. It's just too big. Globoid, when you throw globoid, my first thought, and usually a lot of people's thoughts go to pericardial effusion and pericardial effusion. Um, there was a case out of Montreal, not too, uh, it was a while ago now, but pericardial effusion and its relationship to the globoid cardiac silhouette on a radiograph actually depends on the volume of effusion and the time with which the fluid's been there. So if you have, in order to get the globoid shape, you have to stretch that pericardium, and that takes a little bit of volume, and it takes a little bit of time. And so you can have pericardial effusion without the globoid shape in order to make things more complicated. But for simplicity's sake, and for this sort of session, we could say, look, globoid shape, think pericardial effusion. Uh, this patient doesn't have a globoid shape, so I think probably doesn't have pericardial effusion. But even with pericardial effusion, if you're worried about cardiac tamponade, right, that increased pressure in the pericardium reduces right-sided filling because the pressures on the right side of the heart are less than the left. So the right side of the heart gets affected first. And so you get a right-sided congestive heart failure where you get some pleural fluid, the caudal vena cava is massive, the liver is big, and you get ascites. You don't end up with edema of the, uh, of the lung. So a six-month-old dog vomiting. Vomiting six month old dog, We've got a VD view, a left lateral view, left VD and right lateral view. So do you see anything abnormal? What's your diagnosis? Maybe what would you do next? All right, anybody, let's a minute and a half. Anybody see anything wrong? You know, if you wanna take a stab, you could start with abnormalities. The way we write our reports is we say findings, things that are normal, abnormal, then we conclude what do we think is going on, try to tie a little bow on it, and then we recommend. Um, I typically like to stay towards imaging-only recommendations, and so we then recommend 
things. If you need surgery, you need surgery, and we make those recommendations certainly, but um, that's sort of how I structure it. So you could throw out the abnormalities, pertinent negatives, things that you don't think are abnormal. I, I guess what I could also do while you guys are forming an opinion is I can, since some of you are new, I can show you how I go through an abdominal study. So I do it the same way every time. First thing I do is I look at the caudal thorax and I do it on all three views. And I really like to look at the left lateral view to make sure that I'm not getting any pneumonia, pleural fluid, edema, esophageal dilation, foreign material, you name it, trauma. Um, then I look at the liver. So the liver, the gastric axis should be parallel to the ribs or perpendicular to the vertebral column. This liver, may you may think it looks a little bit chunky, but uh, young dogs, confirmed here with the open physes on the stifled joints in the vertebral column, young dogs have a relatively large liver relative to their body size, so it's not hepatomegaly. This is the splenic head. Likewise, all that antigenic stimulation from the dog's younger age will result in the spleen that's kind of chunky. Here's a right kidney. I'm not going to pretend. I don't really see the kidneys over here because there's a lot of over overlying GI. This is the left kidney. So I'm using the different uh, lateralities. Typically with the right, they separate a little bit more. But there's the left kidney, and then hiding behind it is the right kidney. Here's the region of the urinary bladder. is a thigh muscle going over. But this is how I look caudal thorax. Then I go liver. Then I look at the kidneys. Then I look at the spleen. Then I look at the urinary bladder. And uh, it's probably right there. And I just kind of look, and I say, ah, there's no calculi. Os penis, no calculi. Urethra is ventral. So I look ventral. The entire penile urethra is not included. It's probably cut off, but we don't have any history of stranduria. Then the next thing is the gut, the GI tract, right? And that's the hardest thing. So see what I just did? I just looked at a comment. We got like reduced. Let's just drop these things. We've got reduced cirrhosis of the tail, plication, sharp turns. Okay. Um, I love barium, barium, barium. I'll tell you why I wouldn't do barium in this dog, but I love barium. I think you should do lots of barium. I think that's great. Um, so the GI tract, like that's why they take it, right? The dog's young, he's eating something. There's there's mineral chunks in his stomach. He's got all this stuff, he's vomiting. They bring him in, right? And so the first thing I do is I look at the stomach. Stomach should be in a, in a relatively similar position throughout all the animals. Right, and the colon is usually in a similar position. It's the small intestine that's the that's the where all the drama is. So here's the stomach. This whole structure right through here. Here's the stomach. So this stomach, I would say, is moderately distended. All this stuff is a combination of fluid. There are these like fairly round and discreetly margined soft tissue structures. There's amorphous soft tissue. There's small intestine. Uh, there's there's small mineral chunks. Here's the pylorus. The body, this is all stomach right here, okay? So it swings way out here. This is all stomach right here, okay? And the stomach is all right through here. So the stomach's pretty big, okay? The next thing that you wanna find out is the colon. And so the colon, if the dog is fairly well positioned, which this dog is, when you rotate the dog, it will dip the colon because you want to find the colon because if something's not the colon and it's too big, then you're worried about small intestinal obstruction. Okay. Or, or sorry, you're worried about a segmental distension of the small intestine, which could lead to all sorts of stuff. So the colon likes to hang out in this area and it will sort of deviate a little bit into this plane. So if you're seeing large loops in this area, you, you got to think maybe it's colon. The colon will come out like this and it goes around like this and it comes around like this. I, I'm having a hard time seeing the colon because of all the other stuff. But this is colon. It probably comes up like here, and this is probably colon right here. So my guess is it does this, kind of comes up, then it comes at me, then it comes back, right? So that means all of this is small intestine, okay? Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that the stomach has these small mineral opacities in it right here, these little chunks. And what's interesting is some of the chunks are also in the small intestine. So, um, it's kind of like Mother Nature's barium or Mother Nature's contrast. You remember those things called BIPs or barium impregnated polyethylene spheres? You'd give those little, little tiny things and you'd see if they would, these little barium impregnated 
uh, very, there's like two different sizes and you drop them in and you'd see where they would go. So it's kind of encouraging that some of the mineral has, has made it. So when I describe this small intestine, we describe the size, the course, and the content. So the size, are they too big? I think they're a little bit too big. Uh, are they all uniform in size? Does everybody look like they're hanging out at the same party? I think these all kind of look, yeah, I mean, this one's like a little bit bigger maybe than this one, but this has got this grainy stuff in it and grainy, 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 grainy. Everybody kind of looks like they're, they're, they're relatively similar in size. The course. So the course is, are they plicated? Are they corrugated? Or are they making nice and gentle turns? One of the ways that you can sort of, if you're having a hard time with that, is you want to see, are the intestine, especially in dogs, are they sort of dispersed throughout the gut? Or are they sort of concentrated in one area? So you've got small intestine caudally. You've got it sort of in the middle. It's creeping up here in the cranial aspect. You've got small intestine. I mean, this all can't be colon over here. This all can't be colon. So you've got it sort of all over small intestine, small intestine. And these are making pretty gentle turns. There's no plication. There's no uh, corrugation. Plication, when you use that word, you're implying that there's a linear form body. Corrugation, when you use that word, you're implying that there's uh, an inflammatory process of some sort. So I would describe these small intestine as the small intestine is mildly uniformly distended with a combination of amorphous soft tissue and gas. Um, there's no evidence of plication. Uh, the content, we described it, amorphous soft tissue. And so for me, I think this dog is definitively not obstructed. I think these discussions about cirrhosal detail are challenging because the animal's young. They have more brown fat. Brown fat holds water. Water uh, doesn't allow that differential attenuation with the normal abdominal fat fat, yellow fat that we get when we age. And so you lose that cirrhosal detail. Plus they always have a little bit of fluid in there as well. But when you have a stomach that's this distended and you have a liver that's kind of chunky and you have a spleen that's kind of chunky, liver chunky, spleen chunky, and that's normal chunky for this little dog. But when you've got these organs that are so big, there's only so much room in the belt. So the things get crowded and we call it visceral crowding. And so when you crowd things, it sort of looks like there's a loss of cirrhosal detail. So this is a dog, when you see stuff in the stomach, I can't tell you that this is not all foreign material, but to me, it looks like there's probably some food and probably some chunks of foreign material. It's encouraging that some of it has made it into the colon. And I think all of the small intestine looks fairly uniform in size. And it's probably either got incompletely digested food. Um, and then I think less likely non-obstructed foreign material. So I would, and I recommend it for this case, it came in, I think, last night. I would recommend six hours of fasting, observed fasting. The dog's young, so you don't want to withhold food too long for fear of some sort of hypoglycemic state. But an observed fasting, and then re and, and he's vomiting, and so you could give an anti-emetic, and I don't get into treatment because I don't do it. But what I would do from an imaging standpoint is control to make sure the animal's fasting, do it for six hours seven hours maybe, and then repeat the rads and compare apples to apples and see, is this stomach, does it look smaller? Does it look bigger? If it's bigger, we got a huge problem. If it's smaller, I think we're good and, and we're on our way and we continue the conservative thing. That repeat rad technique will also allow you to look at the small intestine. You can also compare the character of the colon. If, if the colon, if the feces look different, so if you hold the animal and he doesn't vomit, and then you repeat the rads and the stomach's smaller and he hasn't vomited and the small intestine is looking smaller. And then the colon, the fecal character has changed a little bit. Then all signs are pointing towards, uh, you know, let's continue to, to, to support this patient conservatively. Let's not decide to, to cut the dog. Okay. So that's how I would, that's how I would uh, approach this case. I, I would like, I, I love barium. I would not give barium to this dog because there's so much stuff in the stomach that it's going to interfere. Because one of the things that we do with barium is we just assess the time, you know, the transit time. And then we've got all these normals for transit time. And we want to compare our patient to these normals with maybe some variability. But when you've got a bunch of food and foreign material and fluid, it's not going to offer you a great study. So I wouldn't do a barium in this particular patient. I like the cheaper, less messy more 
tech nurse friendly option of uh, fasting repeat rads. Okay, three views of the abdomen. Right lateral view, left lateral view, VD view. Same thing, dog's feeling punky. It's a female spade, five-year-old mixed breed. She's uh, vomiting. Owners are concerned. Dr. Julia, at what age can you be sure that there's no brown fat responsible for poor cirrhosal detail? Well, I don't know. Uh, my experience is that I, I would imagine when those physes start to close, you know, uh, certainly by by a year of age, I, I wouldn't expect to see. Um, I mean, when I interpreted RADs where the, the patients are a year, I'm not talking about loss of cirrhosal detail relative to the patient's younger age. So I feel like it's it's younger. I mean, I, I think six months, you know, it's these young, young animals where all the feces are open, where I feel like things can kind of look squishy inside. And you, you wonder if this uh, loss of cirrhosal detail for no reason or, or, or a pathology. I don't know if that helps. That dog, his young age, I would be totally, um, I would expect to see a little bit of peritoneal fluid on ultrasound normally. Okay, can't make out the urinary bladder. Doc, where do you see the ascites? Are you, you seeing a loss of cirrhosal detail? So there's urinary bladder, right? So let's do let's let's do the let's do the damn thing, right? So cardiac silhouette's huge. We kind of got to cheat on that by looking at the thoracic rads up here. But uh, I don't see any pleural fluid. I look down here. I also kind of look up here. I don't really feel like there's any evidence that the dog has cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Okay. Uh, so the cardiac, the, the caudal, um, the caudal aspect of the chest is fine. The liver is kind of normal, getting a little chunky. Maybe a little bit round, even though the gastric axis is fine. I wonder. Now this is hard, and you're going to have to hallucinate with me. And, and I and I wouldn't don't hold me to this, but I just thought maybe that there was a loss of cirrhosal detail right there. There's a couple of wisps, but I don't know because the dog's hair is probably wet, um, and so I'm not I'm not entirely convinced of that. Um, urinary bladder small and fluid opaque. Here's a left kidney right here. It's normal. There's the splenic head there. This is the cranial pole of the right kidney. So the right kidney is kind of hiding in here. Um, let's see if we can get these kidneys. Here's a left kidney. There's probably the splenic head. And then I can't really see the right kidney. Okay, this is a great example where the dog is rotated right here. See these ribs that are offset? And watch what happens to the colon. It dips down here and then it comes back up. And this all he's more properly positioned so now this colon is more in the in the plane right you want to know where that colon is because you want to make sure that if there's anything big that's dilated in this in this ventral abdomen down here it's game on for possibly the small intestine but this dog is rotated so this is colon one of the things that i like to see is the colon has formed feces and so this feels very acute which maybe gives you a little bit of time then you got the small then you got the stomach right here i know i said stomach and then colon but you know you get the picture you go the stomach right here compared to that last one this stomach is only mildly distended right but it has something in it which isn't normal for a vomiting animal there's also this mineral funk right here which i'm not actually convinced is inside the stomach it could be in the uh, liver could actually be a focus of nodular fat necrosis bates bodies i don't know if you guys have seen those but i'm not convinced that that's gi foreign material but this is the stomach right here it's got chunks of stuff in it okay so then we're looking at the small intestine, the size. Does everybody look the same size? Is somebody bigger? Is somebody, what, what do we think? I think everybody's kind of the same size. Is this thing right here that caught my attention? Um, but I'm not sure where that is. I don't see it on this view. And I don't see it on that view. So I think the small intestine is all fairly similar in size, and I don't think it's pathologically dilated. I do think some of these look a little bit uh, sort of bunched on this radiograph, but man, they don't look that bunched on this view. 
here, here, here's one, here's one, there's one way up here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. And then they don't look as bunched on this view. So I do think maybe there, there's some amorphous soft tissue within some of these small intestinal loops. So this is another case where I don't think the dog has a GI obstruction. I do think there's some things in the small intestine. I do think there's some things in the, in the stomach. And I think if you wanted, this would be another case where you could fast the patient. It's an adult, so you could do eight hours, 12 hours, send them home, fast, come back, repeat RADS, and see, is this chunk missing? Uh, is the stomach smaller? Is the small intestine smaller? Is the clonic stuff, uh, clonic material changed? So I have not obstructed this done. Caveat is, what is this? I, I don't know what this structure is. Sometimes you have radiolucent form materials like fruit pits that can kind of look like that. Because this is cecum. Ascending colon comes right around here, transverse descending colon. So that structure is in the small intestine. But even though I see that, and even though I, I, I think, well, what could that be foreign material? I still, this is not an obstructive pattern. So you will see, I'm sure you've all seen cases where you see something foreign. Just because something's foreign in the gut, your next step is to say, well, is it actually causing a surgical problem? And I don't think even if this thing is a fruit pit, even if this stuff back here is foreign material, there's not a surgical abdomen at this point in time. You fast the dog, you bring them in 12 hours later, you repeat RADS, it's bigger. Uh oh, segmental dilation of the small intestine. Maybe now we've got a surgical problem, but at this point in time, I would not cut my own dog. I would, however, given the stomach has stuff in it, and there's some things that we've identified in the small intestine, I would probably follow up, especially if the dog's not doing any better. All right, there's some comma shaped small intestinal loops, gas patterns in the left lateral bone. So like the, the, this stuff, these little comma things. The problem is, is I don't feel like I see, I, I, I don't disagree with you. Like these little crescent shaped things right here, right here. We've been taught that you got to look for commas. Okay. But two things made me think to chill out on this one. The first one is, okay, they're not that big. Now, you can't put all your eggs in that basket and go, well, it's not that dilated, and so therefore it's not an obstruction. But my first thought is, wow, those don't look that distended, right? And so if there's a linear foreign body that's anchoring, you get dilation with, with enough time. Certainly within 24 hours, you'll get dilation. So these all kind of look the same, even though we've got commas, right? So when you when you view and when you're attempting to, to interpret pathology, you don't want to just focus in on one um, you don't want to focus in on just one particular Rentgen sign size and then just or, or shape or margin. You want to try to put, put it all together to form this, this, this opinion. Now, when I look at the VD view, I don't see any commas. The commas are, 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 have just gone away. So if we're going to use our Rankin signs, we're going to say, I think it's abnormal on the lateral views that there's this sort of comma shape. Okay, so that's one. You can sort of make a pros and cons. That's one going, uh-oh, linear form body. But then the next one, you got to go, well, wait a minute. They're not too big. Okay. And then the next column is you go, well, wait, it doesn't persist when I look at this view. So that's two strikes, you know, for non-obstructed, one strike for obstructed. And from there, you go, everybody kind of looks the same size. That's three. And so then you go, all right, well, there's three here and there's one, four. I'm not going to cut the dog because I've got some evidence to suggest it's not obstructed. And so I think the take home point for me is I would cut the animal when you when you can sort of put all these ducks in a row and go, this thing is definitely obstructed because they're too, they're too big. They're segmentally too big. Um, there's either plication like this. If you're worried that this is plication, if your mind told, told you that your eye so this is plication. So the size, the shape, and the margin. Too big, the shape is plication. Um, sorry, size, shape, and content. So if you see foreign material, if you see plication, and if you have a segmental distension, it's sort of game on. So I don't know if that is, is helpful at all. It's, I mean, it's not easy. Okay, three views of an abdomen. This is a, this is a cat. It's a young cat, and he's vomiting. Bottle thorax looks pretty good. The ventral liver margin is sharp. It's a young cat, right? You can see these sort of physeal 
lines right here on these end plates, they're still faint, but you look down here at the stifle, you got a little bit of a capital femoral physis up here is open. So it's a young patient. That would explain the chunky liver. I think this liver is too big, but he's a young animal. So I think it's fine. Here's the left kidney. Here's the right kidney. Here's the urinary bladder, a little bit of fluid. This is superficial inguinal lymph node. That's kind of cool. If those things make you get you excited, but here you go. This is a left kidney. This is the right kidney. There's not a third kidney. They're overlapping. So it's um, superimposition of the kidneys. This is hyalur fat, well fleshed cat. This falciform fat right here. So that's the hilum. That's the hilum. That's fine. Tebal column's fine. Here's the stomach. Okay. The stomach is right here. I would describe the stomach as being mildly distended with fluid and gas. Here's the stomach right through here. Okay. Here's the colon. Boom. Does some loop de loop here. Uh, then it kind of comes down here and then it comes around there. So let's check this out. It comes out here. This is probably the loop de loop. So it kind of folds back on itself, comes up around here. So the colon looks okay. Maybe some incompletely formed feces slash fluid here. Okay. So the rest is the small intestine. Okay. So small intestine is always the hardest, right? So size, coarse content. Let's do size, coarse, and content. Uh, the size, they're either empty or mildly fluid filled slash thick wall. People say you can't tell the difference between thick walled and, and, um, and a, you can't de detect wall thickness on a radiograph. I kind of think you can in some instances. So these are either empty or there's a little bit of fluid or thick wall. The course. What do we think about the course? We look for plication, would imply linear foreign body. We look for corrugation, which would imply aneritis, or they're sort of normal, where they're nice, gent gentle, flowing. Um, let me see if I can. Okay. So these loops right here, if you look right here, these I would describe as gentle turns, empty, gentle. Just see how they're gentle. They look like noodles. Little bag of little bag of noodles, spaghetti. Okay, very gentle. Let's go back to this cat. That was a dog, but let's go back to this cat. Okay. What do we think of this one? Oh my god! I just can't even look. Look at these. I mean, first of all, look look at look at this margin right here that's not normal look at this margin boink 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 look at this boom 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 you, you could imagine that this thing's just doing this and then let's look at this view look at this margin right here and then this margin right here look at this boink boink look at all this now if you hallucinate with me, you'll see this structure. It's just, there's, my mentor called them momental wedgies. So there's fat, there's fat, there's fat, there's fat interdigitating between the plication of the small intestine. So there's a linear foreign body. Cut the cat, cut it. Straight to surgery. He's probably, check his tongue, but it's probably, given how plicated this, this intestine, this intestine up here is probably the duodenum. And given how plicated it is, it's probably anchored at the pyloric outflow. So uh, this is definitively obstructed. Needs surgery. Burn this into your uh, burn this into your retina um, because you'll see this. Now the cats with linear foreign bodies, they they pretty much kind of stick to this. They look they look like this. Dogs, on the other hand, are very difficult. Dogs in linear foreign bodies. Uh, are, are not are not as easy. Okay, so let's see here. Got a, maybe two more cases, and then we'll, we'll call it quits. Unless you guys want to keep going. Gentle. We we call them gentle. Gentle turns. Nice gentle. Just kind of instead of just the the plication where it folds back on itself. Like, all right. Anybody got anything? The cat. Still fairly young. These end plates look like they have like a physeal scar. The 
Fices on the stifle joints are closed. Anybody see anything abnormal? Let's start with abnormal. You go with abnormalities and then you get to the diagnosis. Because sometimes when you have conflicting, when you try to go to the diagnosis right away, I think it's really difficult and you're, you're likely to make a mistake. I think if you try to sort of write down that there's this abnormality and there's this abnormality and there's this abnormality, then you take a step back and you go, can I fit all these nicely into an explanation for why the cat's on my x-ray table? Yes or no. Um, and in this particular case, I, I think you can. So the caudal thorax is fine. The liver is right here. The liver looks small for probably two reasons. Well-fleshed cat, okay, and the stomach is here. It's huge. Big bag of fluid, a little bit of gas. So this big old stomach, it makes the liver kind of look smaller, okay? Here's one kidney. Here's the caudal pole left kidney, caudal pole, caudal pole of the right. Here's the right kidney. Here's the left kidney. Here's the urinary bladder. It's fluid opaque. Here's the colon round goes around here like that okay here's the colon here's the spleen that's cute sorry that wasn't me sorry there's a delay come on here's the spleen right here okay if you hallucinate you can see the left kidney right here hiding over here left right kidney hiding over here okay big old bag of fluid right here there's the stomach okay Look at this right here, that margin right there. And then look at these right here. Look at this margin, boom, 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 boom. Dr. Allen's in an airplane just yelling into the, the, uh, the or she's probably, bunch. This is a linear foreign body. The cat's obstructed. If you see a stomach this big in a cat, like do not let the cat walk out of your clinic. You got to figure out why the hell it's got all that fluid in there. Maybe it's a functional ileus gastric atony because of pancreatitis, maybe, but you need to you need to do whatever you need to do to make sure that the animal doesn't have an obstruction. Okay. So this is plicated small intestine right through here. You can see it just looks like it's it's just this doesn't look so corrugated. They're plicated to me. But this whole structure right through here, it just like look at this. Boom, boom. That margin, that this should not do that. Now on this view, where's that other view? Right, these are taking more normal turns out here. See how you, they just look, but then see in here, I don't know. This this view is not the best to try to convince you. Um, that view, that's nasty, right, right through here, all along there. This up here as well is probably the duodenum, and then it looks plicated. The reason I wasn't, Excited to call it plication is because on this view, it looks more corrugated. Okay, so here's a good example of corrugation. You see how it looks sort of like a piece of, it's spastic. It looks like sort of bacon. That's not plicated. Um, okay, any questions, comments, concerns? You're going to see one of these and you're just going to be like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Obstructed surgery. Let's do one more case. Okay, last case, vomiting dog, female spade. There's no os penis. Uh, no feisty, so, you know, it's probably middle age. Cute vomiting. Left lateral view. Another left lateral view. BD view. All right. You guys tell me what you think. I'm going to walk you through how I diagnose this. Caudal thorax is normal, right? No pneumonia. It's a left lateral view. No pneumonia. Liver, nice sharp margin. Gastric access parallel to the rib. That's nice. 13, 12, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 13, 12. You got to be careful with diagnosing disc disease, but man, that looks kind of small. Maybe that one too. So maybe. Here's a left kidney. Kidneys are kind of stacked on each other, a little further caudal than normal. So then you go, is there anything pushing them? Uh, not really. There's the caudal pole right there, the right kidney. There's the left kidney. There's the splenic head. Tiny looking liver right there, but it still looks perpendicular, so it's there. This is a shitty rad, right? They cut off the caudal. Two things probably happened. Um, my guess is because of the sharp margin right there. You see that sharp margin? That means it was cropped. Maybe the person just didn't know what they were doing and they cut off the urinary bladder. Maybe they had a hand. They like to hide their hands. 
Okay, so here's the stomach right through here, left lateral view, so that's the pylorus, right? So if you put the dog down on their left side, you should sort of have gas. It doesn't always work out this way, but you'll have gas that's on the right side of the stomach, right? So here's the, the right side of the stomach. Here's the left side of the stomach. So if you put this side on the table down, all the gas goes this way, and you end up with this view. So this pyloric outflow, great shot because you're looking for an obstruction that kind of sticks out. But then there's this thing that looks like the gas. I mean, that's probably the duodenum. It's definitely in the area of the duodenum and this structure right here. And that looks a little bit too big, but this is nice and gas filled. Okay. So this is colon, colon. I kind of lose it. Here it goes. And I kind of lose it. I don't know. Why does it look like intestines are dorsal to the stomach? So I agree with you that part of the reason that this right kidney may be, you know, this right kidney, a couple of things. The right kidney is too far caudal. It's just, it, it's usually not this far caudal and usually not this far ventral. Usually it's hiding up here. If there was a big liver, maybe it would be pushing it back or there's an adrenal mass, it'd be pushing it back. But we're talking about a skimpy looking liver here and then maybe saying, yeah, there's just enough liver. So it's not the liver. So yes, I think maybe some of the intestine has gotten up in here, but the intestine is in the peritoneal space, not the retroperitoneal space where the kidney lives. So I'm not entirely sure. I don't want to talk about, you know, an entrapment because it's not a word I use commonly in small animals, and it's not a horse with nephrosplenic entrapment, but uh, both laterals are labeled left. Yeah, because I, I think they sometimes they just do that. But I think they're both left. I don't think that's a mistake. Um, so I, to answer your question, I'm not sure why the intestine is up there. I would be surprised that there was some sort of entrapment um, sometimes things can just migrate around like that, but there could be one explanation because um, everybody's found this structure right there, right? So this structure, so this is a segment of small intestine and that's your foreign body. Small intestine and this structure is your foreign body. See that nice gas soft tissue interface? So it's right through here. And what's nice about this is you all have all of these that are pretty much empty. Not pretty much, they are empty. I would describe these as normal in size, comma, course, and content. All the same size, course, uh, and, and content. So this is probably the duodenum. This is probably the small intestine. And so you've got a proximal small intestinal mechanical obstruction and, and uh, the dog should go to surgery. I'll leave you with this and then we'll go. This just shows you a great example of the, the uh, I guess, First, I would show you that this animal's obese. This liver is too small. The stomach, here's the stomach right here. It's full of fluid and gas, mild to moderately distended, and the gastric access is just tipped forward. And it persists on both of these views, and it persists right here. That's all liver, okay? So, but this is a great example of, of why I think it, it makes no sense not to take a right and a left lateral, okay? So this is the right lateral. And this is the left lateral. And so on the right lateral view, on the right lateral view, this part of the stomach goes down on the table. So all the fluid sloshes down here and it just makes it look like there's a whiteout, which is kind of like this. Okay. But then when you put the left side on the table, all the fluid goes down here. And so then all the gas goes up to the pylorus. And then you have this. Okay. So this is the stomach. This whole thing is the stomach. But that is your foreign body. And that thing is anchored here, and it probably goes down the duodenum and then ends up in the proximal small intestine. And then the rest of the small intestine is completely empty. Here it is right here. That's not colon because the colon doesn't run perpendicular to the vertebral column, regardless of how crooked the animal is. This cardiac silhouette's kind of skimpy, so I wouldn't be surprised if the animal's a little behind on its fluids. But this is a great example of, of taking that left lateral view. Okay, any other questions, concerns, comments? One of the things, some of you probably, um, these will just be recycled on this YouTube channel, not trying to go viral, just trying to help a few dogs. Um, here are the opacities. If you want to write those down, those are all on 
the radiograph, right? This is fat, uh, let's say gas, and then fat, and then soft tissue, and then mineral, and then this is supposed to represent metal. These are the Rentkin signs that we use, size, shape, number, location, opacity, and margin. It's good to practice using all those um, instead of what I did when I started, which is you just sort of you try to diagnose it instead of work through the process. Um, but that's that's it. All right, I'm out. Next Monday, 6 p.m., I'll see you there. Uh, I will email you, and uh, you'll get the link. And thanks for tuning in. Hopefully it was helpful. See ya.